chair of Incozi UK's Early Careers Forum. Um, I'm joined here by a uh, newly elected deputy chair, uh, Nancy Dante. Um, and uh, I see we, we, we've also got uh, Shay, uh, uh, events coordinator uh, on the line as well. Um, so yeah, this is the, the second session in our new series of systems engineer in a year. Um, and uh, the idea is to um, go through various different topics of system engineering, various skills, um, and just try and get people uh, some some of that good good systems engineering goodness uh, throughout the year. Um, so we'll kick off as as we often do with just a quick run through of uh, what or who are the ECF, uh, as we're aware that we uh, often get new people on these calls. So um, we've been going for about six years now, um, and we're part of the International Council of System Engineers in Cozy UK and uh, sit, sit on the council as well and uh, really the, the overall aim is to provide a gateway for individuals to broaden their engagement with the SE community and um, we do that through five main objectives uh, advise promote support challenge and communicate and uh, we're really really keen to see what we can do to improve in all of these areas um, I've, I've introduced myself already um, but um, I'd like to uh, take this moment to uh, also more formally introduce um, our newest committee member, uh, Nincy, um, who has just been elected the deputy chair. So, uh, Nincy, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Nathan, for the introduction. So, just as Nathan said, I've recently been elected as deputy chair of the ECF, and I want to thank all the members of the ECF that voted for me, who are present here and who aren't, and are joining us from wherever they are, and. Just to give you a bit of background on myself, I studied mechanical engineering at University of Leicester, and I then went on to study oil and gas engineering at postgraduate level at the University of Brunel. And then I went on and worked as a quality engineer for a year, and now I find myself as a graduate systems engineer at New Malden in uh, Northrop Grumman. And so I joined the ECF committee because I thought after attending ASEC last year, it was very much a welcoming committee and I thought as a newly systems grad, I thought it's a good idea to actually develop my learning and understanding by joining the ECF. And when I saw there was a vacancy in the committee, I thought, okay, I'll go for it because I enjoy outreach activities. I enjoy speaking to people and it's a good learning opportunity as well. And just raising awareness of systems engineering because as I've explained my background, I've studied a few disciplines, but systems is one discipline you don't really really hear about in the industry so I thought I want to be part of the people who want to raise awareness and get it out there and also just bring more people because it's such a diverse skill set that's required and I think many people have that thank you very much Nathan yeah thank you Nancy great to have you on board um Rebecca Riddler is also um a, a new member to our committee uh, unfortunately I think she's been having some some laptop issues so she's not able to join us right now um, but rest assured she is also happy to be here uh, we promise um, so yeah it's uh, great to have a, a, a refreshed rejuvenated um, committee um, so Shay Tom and I have, have been in, in the committee for about a year now um, I've, I've recently gone up to uh, replace Amelia as ECF chair so only been in the role a month myself um, but yeah, it's good to have some fresh faces, new ideas, and uh, see where that takes us. So we'll move on to uh, the, the sort of meat and potatoes of today's session. So uh, we're looking at systems thinking, as you may have guessed. So starting off very classically with the textbook definition, um, systems thinking is effectively a framework for understanding complex situations. And complex situations, we all know, very big part of the uh, reason for being of systems engineering. The systems thinking helps in simplifying and clarifying these situations, uh, capturing and examining perceptions of this, these situations, um, capturing and examining the dependencies and influences between the elements that actually make up your system, and uh, help exploring the situation from different viewpoints as well. Um, so in practice, it requires us to consider the whole situation and the context that it sits in, but it raises the issue of how can we be holistic, you know, getting a view of the whole system without getting bogged down in all of the detail that comprises that system. 
Additionally, it requires us to understand the structure of our system and the dependencies between all of the elements in order to understand and predict what is known as emergent behaviour. And I'll go on to describe that in a bit more detail in the following slides. But how do we do this without being confused by all the complexity that's inherent to our system? And finally, system thinking requires us to understand the system from different perspectives, different viewpoints of numerous stakeholders. But how do we reflect those views whilst also still combining them into a comprehensive understanding of the overall system? Well, let's go on. So emergence is something that all systems display. It's quite a key part of understanding systems thinking. Um, and so we'll go into it in a bit of detail, but it's effectively behavior that a system displays as a whole. It only appears or emerges once you've got all of the constituent elements, components, subsystems, and you actually put them together to form your system. You can't deduce emergent behavior just by looking at the properties and behaviors of your constituent components. But one of the key things to notice here is that your, your mind might immediately go to, oh, that sounds like bad behavior. That sounds like unwanted stuff, but you can actually have it be desirable as well as undesirable. In fact, you often the reason you construct a system in the first place is to achieve that um, emergent behavior. So what's an example of this? Well, on screen, we've got a pen and you can see it decomposed into its various elements. You've got uh, the sort of the nib, the inkwell, the spring, the button that you press down to actually um, get the nib to, to come out of the end of the pen. And basically the, the properties that that pen exhibits, its behavior aren't found in any of these individual components. You can't pick up the nib of the pen and immediately start writing. You could maybe join it to the inkwell and give it a stab at writing, but you'll find that it tends to be quite, uh, quite shaky, quite all over the place because you haven't got the structure of the pen supporting it. And only when you put all of those pieces together, do you get the desirable emergent behavior of leaving a fine trail of ink that can be read. But you do also have undesirable emergent behavior. Now, what I've got on screen is quite a, a classic example. If you've had any sort of graduate training, perhaps, or introduction to system engineering, you may have come across this example. Uh, does anyone know how a French rail company managed to spend 12 billion pounds, or about $20 billion, I think, can't remember what that is in euros, on trains that are too wide? Anyone wants to come off mute or put anything in the chat? If you know. That's OK. Well, I'm glad I'm uh, not preaching to the converted. This will be new to you all. Uh, effectively, uh, a few years ago, a French rail company, um, SNCF, um, invested uh, hugely into a series of uh, new trains um, and they consulted with a um, sort of rail network to get the dimensions of all of the platforms um, that these trains will be passing through. Um, now, unfortunately, uh, that company only provided SNCF with the dimensions of platforms that were constructed within the last 30 years. And many railway stations have existed for a considerably longer period of time than that. So it transpired that I think off the top of my head around about uh, 1300 platforms out of about 8000 in this network were actually too too wide or rather um, they extended too far out towards the railway track uh, for these trains to actually fit on. So they had to spend 12 billion pounds and a considerable amount of time basically shaving back these platforms, modifying them uh, to accommodate uh, these trains because that was deemed cheaper than um, getting rid of the trains and starting over. Um, so that is a great example of emergent behavior because uh, that system wasn't considered as a whole. Those rural platforms, older platforms, were very much a part of the system uh, that the trains would be interacting with, but they weren't considered in full detail and their emergent, emergent properties of the train interacting with the platforms were revealed later on. So um, yeah, it can cause some, some pretty big mess ups. Um, but we do actually desire a degree of emergence in our products, uh, processes and services, uh, but you do also get that undesirable behavior. And quite a lot of that we attempt to live with, um, but we also attempt to minimize uh, the undesirable emergent behavior where we can. So an example of both in practice is a television. 
for television as its uh, uh, sort of purpose, you know, it generates moving images and sound. And that is a desirable set of emergent properties that only come together when that TV is fully assembled. But it also produces vibration and a decent amount of heat, which overall uh, results in a quite low energy efficiency and putting in more power than you need to, which costs you money. So that's undesirable. Similarly, uh, a car, uh, an emergent property when it's all assembled together and fueled up, is that it transports passengers and their baggage. But it does also produce pollution in form of noise and physical emissions as well. Uh, and then just as a little cheeky one, you've got things like social media, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. And uh, those have the desirable effect of being able to um, engage in entertainment, to be able to catch up on your friends and find out when their birthdays are, because I know that I suck at remembering them otherwise. But they also have the undesirable emergent behaviour of uh, perhaps spending a little bit more of your day than you anticipated endlessly scrolling through them. Um, and as we saw on the previous slide, emergent behaviour can be quite devastating when it's undesirable, costing millions or billions of pounds, dollars, euros, insert currency here. Um, and there tend to be three causes for um, emergent behaviour. So the first is variation, uh, sort of an unexpected performance where small variations can cause quite a significant change in behaviour. So an example here might be um, when you are maintaining a jet engine, you tend to take it apart to get to the part that needs fixing, and then you have to put it back together. And in putting it back together, you need to make sure that all of the rotating components are correctly balanced, because any small, tiny imbalance can cause uh, vibrational issues, um, which can cause quite significant damage to the engine. Um, and then you've also got sub optimization, sort of unexpected low performance driven by a mistaken belief that the best system has to have the best components. And finally, dynamic, um, unexpected time related behavior. Um, we tend to like to view time in a very nice, simple, linear cause and effect, but uh, often things can occur out of order in sequences that we don't quite uh, anticipate. And Summarising what we've just talked about with uh, emergence is that all systems display it. It's behaviour that is seen in the whole system when everything is assembled together and you can't just predict it by looking at all of the constituent parts. And um, emergence can be desirable, it can also be undesirable. And to understand and predict it, you need to consider the whole which is the systems thinking approach and understand how those components interact with each other, depend on each other and the environment that they all sit within. And um, it's, it's important to note that those of you who are familiar with the V diagram, the V cycle of systems engineering, um, integration is where a lot of this comes in. You don't just manufacture your system and send it out straight into the world. You manufacture the components, you test those components, you combine them into subsystems, you test those subsystems, you combine those subsystems into a system, you test that. And this is where the emergent behaviour that you've uh, perhaps not anticipated rears its uh, ugly or not so ugly head. And um, non-system thinkers are uh, not considering of the whole and can be surprised when that emergence occurs. But systems thinkers consider the whole in a holistic manner and plan for emergence where they can. So I will now hand over to Nincy, who is going to take us through the next section on purpose. Thank you, Nathan. So as Nathan explained, I'll go through purpose and we can say all systems seek to achieve a purpose. So whether man-made or natural, they strive to do something. And when we're creating a new system or modifying an existing one, we want the resultant system to produce something useful. But we need to be careful when using the term useful, because as Nathan earlier described, we can have undesirable emergent effects. And so the purpose of a system is really just a property of a whole. So it's not the purpose of individual components or subsystems within the system, but rather we're looking at a property of the system as a complete. And this is the link with emergence because both of these terms are properties of the system as a whole and not individual components. So if we look on the right, there are a few diagrams that explain the concept of purpose. And the top one has purpose at the top. So again, talking about the purpose of the system. And then it breaks it down into sub purposes and sub sub purposes. And now to not get tied up in the semantics, below we have a diagram which basically explains the sub purposes and sub sub purposes as goals and objectives. 
And as system engineers, we can think of these as requirements and then these requirements being broken down into objectives and then lower level tasks. So you can say that your everyday tasks feed into an objective, which then feeds into a requirement that feeds into the overall stakeholder need, which in this case, we are calling the purpose of the system. If you go to the next things. So now we have a group activity where we are going to determine the purpose of these objects. So we have a five pound note, a bank, a toaster and a television. So as a group, if you feel free to come off mute or type in the chat, what are the purposes of these objects? And then later we're gonna also come up with alternative objects for these purposes once we've determined what the purpose is for those objects. So if anyone feel free to come off mute or put a suggestion in the chat, what is the purpose of a five pound note? We, I mean, we use money to pay things. So, See some people typing in the yeah. chat. Callum says, buy goods. Buy goods, yep. And are we being specific to the five pound note because we can buy goods with a 10 pound note or 20 pound note? Trading of your needs, yep. So can we come up now with an alternative object to a five pound note? A voucher, yeah, a voucher is a good idea. Yeah, 500 pennies. <laughs> five one pound coins. Yeah, five one pound coins. So we can move on to the next one now. Yep, online payment. That, in terms of a bank, can we define the purpose of a bank? Any ideas? Transfer money. Yep. Security for customer money, yep. Providing financial services, borrowing, store money securely, yeah, these are great answers. And in terms of alternative objects for a bank, Yep, lending, saving, yep. Yep, family and friends. <laughs> the bank of <laughs> mum and dad. <laughs> Classic. Should we move on yep. to the last one here uh, in the interest of time, Nancy, television? Yep. So if we just skip the toaster and we just go straight to television, can we define what the purpose of the television is? Yeah, providing sound and moving images. I like that answer. Entertainment. Yep. Audiovisual and just alternative to television. Projector. Yep. Good idea. Projector. Yeah. Theatre. Very good answers. I think we're ready to move on to the next slide, Nathan. Great. Thanks for your participation, everyone. Thank you. So just as we saw in this last activity, determining the purpose isn't exactly straightforward. And now we're going to consider determining the purposes by just focusing on the inputs and outputs of the system. So going back to our example of the TV, here we've defined the inputs of the system being the power, the signal and the user commands and the outputs of the system being light, sound and heat. And now we've also identified the prime ones. So these are really the ones that relate to our desired output. And the prime input here is signal and the desired output is the light and sound. 
So if we want to go down to the basic level, we can say the purpose of a TV is to convert signal to light and sound. And we actually had a good uh, suggestion earlier where someone said provide sound and moving images. So yeah, that's pretty close. But again, we had other examples of entertainment, visual entertainment, and just broadcasting news. And this is the purpose of a TV, but at the higher level. When we go to the base low level, the purpose of the TV is really to convert signal to light and sound. So just at the bottom here, I have a statement that says, determining the purpose depends on what we decide the system is, where the boundary between the system and the outside world. So when we're discussing things like entertainment and broadcasting, that's when we would have to decide, well, is it within the system boundary or is it outside and considered to be environmental factors? And now we can also use purpose to understand so when we're at the beginning of our V model and we are at the conceptual stages of design, sometimes we have our customer or stakeholder statement and then we think, okay, how do we actually organize or build this system? And so a good way to break down our system and understand what components need to be in the system is to consider the system as a purpose. So here we have a diagram where we've put the system purpose at the top. So in the case of our TV, we have convert signal into light and sound. And then we've broken that down into, well, how will the system actually achieve this? So in the case of the TV, how will it convert the signal into light and sound? Well, it will manage the signal, manage the user commands, manage heat and manage power. And then, well, you can ask yourself the question again, how will it manage the signal? And that's been further broken down into, it will receive the signal, decode the signal, generate a picture, generate sound. So you can understand that breaking it down into sub-purposes and sub-sub-purposes would then make us understand, well, these are the components that we need to put in place because we need to have a component that receives a signal and decodes a signal. And then in turn, it will feed into the system that manages the signal and that's a subsystem of the TV. And all of these will link back to the main purpose, which is convert signal into light and sound. So here in the, just the box below I have, these are some of the lower level and sub purposes that are carried out to convert the TV and signal sound. So here we've also uh, pointed out some undesirable outputs like removal of heat. So you will also consider where you want to manage undesirable emergent behaviors and breaking it down into sub purposes and sub sub purposes helps you see where you get your undesirable emergent behavior and then you can put in place a mechanism and how to stop it. So now we can ask ourselves, once we've defined the solution, is this the only solution relating to the purpose? So we defined the purpose of a TV earlier as converting signal to light and sound. Now on this slide, I have different examples of different solutions to the same purpose. So it's just to let you know that there will be advances in technology, new products will come on the market, but essentially the purpose usually remains the same. It's just that with times and trends, you might have different adaptations, but at the core, the purpose of the object remains the same. And just to summarize purpose, all systems have a purpose. So it's really what the system does. And the purpose remains unchanged, as I've just explained. We will have technological advances. People will have new suggestions of the same way of doing things. Well, a different way of doing things, but for the same common purpose. And as system engineers, we need to think about our customer and our stakeholders. They are the people we want to please. And most of them buy into purpose. When you have your stakeholder meetings and you try to capture the requirements, you're essentially wanting to know what does the customer want the system to do? And this is the system purpose. And you can consider the sub sub purposes as lower level requirements and your overall purpose as your high level stakeholder requirements. So we just have this final statement here. It says human brains are not naturally wired to think in terms of purpose. So most people think about things. So at the bottom here, I have non-system thinkers think about things, but system thinkers think in terms of purpose. So to be a great systems engineer, and if you wanna use systems thinking tools, definitely thinking in terms of purpose 
is something that will help you in terms of understanding your system and understanding the subsystems that are required to achieve the overall purpose of your system and at the end of the day, satisfy your stakeholder needs. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you very much, Nancy. Great stuff. You're welcome. So moving on to a tool that is useful in early applications of systems thinking, we've got something called the quad of aims, which you may or may not have come across before. But it's quite a simple tool that you can use quite early on in a project or process um, to help clarify and define the aims or objectives uh, of a system or activity. Um, it's really good in that purpose uh, area. Um, and it does encourage the determination of SMART aims as well. Um, and basically it comprises at the top, you've got a title, pretty self-explanatory. It just describes what your system is or what the activity is. Um, and then you've got four quadrants. You've got the purpose in the top left, which clearly and concisely states what the activity or system is aiming to achieve. Um, we've then got the stakeholders, um, which, uh, precisely which stakeholders actually benefit from the system. So who benefits from it if the purpose is actually achieved and how are they benefited? You've then got the deliverables or end results. So what is actually delivered at the end of an activity? Uh, and you can often list this as the outputs of your system if you have it to that level of, of um, fidelity. And then uh, you've got your measures of success, which determine um, if the end results have actually been achieved. Um, the benefits have been realized, the outputs have been created, and when are those end results actually delivered? So that is an introduction to the quad of aims. Um, we're now going to uh, do a little scenario, which we're going to do in breakout rooms, um, where I'd like you to imagine uh, that you work as a baggage handler for one of the UK's busiest airports, not naming any names. Um, so you're part of a team of eight baggage handlers who have to manage 120 flights in a 12 hour shift. Uh, sorry, Raju, I see you've got your hand up. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I just have a question on your previous slide. How would you differentiate between the purpose and the stakeholder need? <coughs> oh, sorry, benefits. <coughs> yeah, sure. So um, the purpose is more about what is it that the system is trying to do? Um, so, as, as Nincy was saying with purpose earlier, it's about um, trying to understand at a high level, what is our system trying to do? Perhaps you can then break it down into what is that purpose made up of? Um, so it, it's more of a what, whereas the stakeholder benefits is more of a who. So um, in our example that we're going to discuss in a bit more detail um, on the baggage handling, who are, who are the stakeholders that are affected? Uh, who benefit directly from that system and how is it that they benefit from it? Um, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry if I got your name the wrong way around. I'm used to the uh, commas uh, with people's <laughs> surnames first. So. You call me Monisha. Monisha. Thank you for your question, <laughs> Monisha. Great. Um, so the uh, idea here is that um, you're part of a team of eight baggage handlers who have to manage 120 flights in a 12 hour shift. And your team has recently been running late for a few flights, causing some delays. And there have been some events where not all of the passenger suitcases have actually made it onto the plane. Uh, the senior leadership team have asked you to join a small team to investigate how to improve the current system. Um, and we'd like you to uh, perform an exercise on a quad of aims for this system to try and work out. Uh, a little bit more of a systems thinking approach to this. So you'll have, I mean, the idea was to have a couple of breakout rooms, um, but due to attrition over the course of the call, I think we've actually fallen to the number of people for one breakout room. So I think we'll just stay here um, if that's okay with everyone. But uh, it, it saves us a bit of time and admin of shoving people into a room for no good reason. Um, so what I will do is I will act as a scribe um, so if I bring up the templates, can everyone see this screen here? Should be a red box with some words in it. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, 
so uh, what I'd like to do is to go um, sort of uh, square by square, quadrant by quadrant, um, and I'd like to sort of crowdsource um, some some opinions off you as to what you think um, is the purpose of this system, uh, who are the stakeholders that benefit from it and how, uh, what are the deliverables or end results of our baggage handling system and what are the measures of success? Um, so uh, good afternoon, Damesh. Uh, we're just doing an exercise at the moment on a tool called the Quad of Aims, which is a systems thinking uh, method. And we're doing it in the context of a baggage handling system. Um, so we're assuming that we all work for a baggage handling uh, team in a busy airport. Um, and we're interested in uh, understanding the system so that we can improve it uh, as there have been some some delays and issues caused by um, staff uh, leaving due to the pandemic. So would anyone like to start us off? What, what do they think that the purpose of this system might be? Can see some typing in the chat, so I will hold my tongue. So Callum's done it in a little bit of a, a flowchart uh, format, so delivering baggage from the passenger to the plane back to the passenger again. Yeah, I'd say that's quite a nice concise way. I can see Manisha is also typing. And Manisha says that uh, at an overall high level it is about managing the customer baggage. Yeah, it's nice and concise. Um, can anyone think of any any other purpose? Maybe if we go into uh, a slightly uh, lower level of detail, um, slightly decompose it a little bit. Does it aim to do these things in a particular way? Does it aim to do them um, with a particular um manner are we making the assumption that we are going to remain a human-centered system so we're not going to automate in any way so that's a, that's a really good question andrew um and often when we're considering systems it is really tempting to make assumptions um particularly about the nature of the system um, and it's really important when you're taking a system thinking approach to try and try not to constrain yourself too much um, as often uh, by constraining yourself that early on you can end up uh, with a solution that looks very similar to the start so by trying to make your language uh, solution agnostic because it is a term that we like to use, um, it opens you and the people who will end up building the system, it opens them up to a bit more creative freedom. So in short answer, I would say no. Um, but uh, were you in this situation for real, you might have that constraint imposed upon you by the customer. Uh, Nincy has said uh, doing so in a timely manner. I'll add that onto the end of Manisha's statement. And Manisha's also added that uh, it's about checking in and checking out. Great stuff. Um, I can see there's some more typing, but whilst that's happening, I'll just introduce the second box. So who do we think that our stakeholders are uh, with regards to this system in terms of stakeholders who directly benefit from this this process that our system carries out. So 
Nancy has suggested passengers. I can see there are a few more people typing at the same time. If anyone wants to suggest other stakeholders or elaborate a little bit. Airport bosses. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, it's not always the uh, OK, so Dharmesh has put in a bunch. So customers. All right, I'm going to write, write these down. So customers uh, slash passengers. Uh, Callum's even elaborated. So uh, we've got customers, we've got check in desk staff. We've got baggage handlers. Um, light ground crews. I'm not going to fit all of these in. Um, pilots and ATC. Callum said that passengers get their luggage when and where they expect it. The airline operators uh, are enabled to have more passengers coming through, which increases the capability. Manisha has quite brilliantly written it as a user story. Uh, as a customer, I can benefit by securely dropping off in the departure point and collecting it back in the destination point. Very good. Someone's, someone's done their homework. Um, So customers and passengers, so they effectively get their luggage in a timely manner. The, um, and I really butchered the spelling of staff there. I don't know. Uh, the airport bosses was one, they get increased profits. Pilots can take off on time without delays. Yep, that is true, Manisha. So increased revenue. Great stuff. That's really good. In that case, we'll move on to the third box. So deliverables and end results. What is the output of our system? What does it deliver? Nathan, I believe some of the statements you've put, for example, getting their luggage in a safe and timely manner could be considered as a deliverable and the increased revenue and the in decreased delays. Yeah, that is a very yeah. good point. Callum says literally baggage <laughs> is a deliverable. Yeah. <laughs> uh, efficiency. So um, baggage is indeed a deliverable. Uh, cost savings due to uh, not paying delay fees. Uh, customer satisfaction, that is good. It is, um, it's always really good to, when you're looking at deliverables and end results, it is not always a physical thing. As engineers, uh, first and foremost, it can be quite difficult to think of things that aren't physical. Uh, but so often what we deal with in systems is abstract and something like customer satisfaction can be quite, it's not tangible, can be difficult to quantify, but it is a deliverable, it is an end state. Um, and yeah, it's really important to be able to separate out those tangibles and intangibles and yeah, see that more abstract uh, side of things. Great stuff. Well, we'll move on to the final one then. What are the measures of success? So how will the stakeholders know that the end results have been achieved? Uh, when will those results be delivered? How can we actually measure the success of our system? What, what does that look like? The rate of incorrect baggage destination, time to reach destination, flights departing on time and no delays. Yeah, that would be be an interesting one to, to track. Um, We've got baggage on the correct flights, yep. Uh, reaching the correct terminal, yes. Delivered to the appropriate customer, yep. 
So passengers receiving correct luggage. Um, reduced complaints from the customer. Yeah, that is definitely something that is measurable and trackable because um, you might have a complaints portal. You be able to talk to your staff at the help desk. Yeah, all, all measurable things, which makes them achievable. So thank you everyone there for your participation. That's really appreciated. Um, we've got a quite a decently filled out quad of aims here. Um, so I'm happy to call that one a success. Um, we've uh, managed to nicely, neatly sidestep around the uh, people presenting because we all just did it together. So uh, I will go back to the main presentation where we'll, we'll wrap up the summary and allow some time for questions as well. So to summarise the quad of aims, it's quite a typical systems thinking tool. It's quite easy to use. It's quite easy to pick up. Um, it encourages seeing things from different viewpoints, not just yourself as a user of the system, but who else is affected by it. It organises, promotes and clarifies your thinking. Um, can be used by individuals or as we just saw amongst ourselves in a team. Uh, and in particular, that's going to get you a more holistic overview. Um, and it helps share information and arrive at a common understanding and records it as well. Uh, you can use it in lots of different contexts, not the one that we just did. So training courses, workshops, meetings, projects. Uh, if you're preparing for a presentation that you might be delivering, uh, reviews, products, processes and services. It's got quite wide ranging appeal. Um, and I hope that that is able to um, be something that you can take away and potentially use in some of your your day job um, when you're when you're starting a new task is to it's very very easy often when you start a new task to have an idea in your head of what it looks like and start going down down a rabbit hole towards it and then realize halfway through you didn't quite get the right idea off the uh, uh, when you jumped the gun um, I know I've been there and sometimes doing that pre-work uh, prevents quite a lot of rework so to summarise what we've learned over the course of this presentation, uh, system thinking is an approach that helps us to recognise, relate and resolve complexities in our increasingly interconnected world. Um, it's full of lots of different tools and approaches, uh, only the surface of which we've scratched here. There are lots uh, involved um, and it helps us identify different scenarios, frame them differently and uh, plan for uh, things like emergent behaviour and interview and review those accordingly. It's got quite immediate application um, in all sorts of scale of activity from uh, very small activities like we just saw all the way through to massive contemporary issues like COVID-19. Um, and being able to develop a capability, your capability in systems thinking is something that is in all of our interests. It will make us all better systems engineers um, and uh, it can it can help you in not just that, but in everything you do as well. Um, and I'd like to sort of offer a bit of food for thought at the end of um, how do you think systems thinking is applicable outside of systems engineering? And I'll give you a quick hint. Uh, it is. But um, I'd like to thank you all for, for listening, all for your time. Um, and we've still got 15 minutes left in the slot. Uh, not that we need to, to use all of that. But uh, if anyone has any questions at all um, on system thinking, on ECF in general, uh, please feel free to either come off mute and suggest it or um, put something in the chat. I can see some people are typing, so I'll just wait. But a uh, minute to go to Manisha's point, these uh, slides will be sent out and the recording will be put on the Incozy UK um, YouTube channel as well. Uh, Andrew has shared an article on Medium, um, Tools for System Thinkers, the six fundamental concepts. Yeah, great stuff. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, you're very welcome, everyone. I um, We'll call it there then, but thank you very much for your time. Thanks for listening attentively. Thanks for contributing as well. Makes these things uh, much more doable. So, um, yeah, I hope you all have a good rest of your day. Take care.